Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week we are speaking with Dave Lee. Dave probably needs no introduction, but as this is in fact the introduction to the show, you're going to get one. Dave is an author, novelist, which are two separate things, breathworking and personal development coach based in the UK. He is also one of the formational influences on the rise of chaos magic. Dave has himself been a practicing magician for over 35 years. His latest book is Life Force, and it arrived just in time to line up with our sporadic series of energy model discussions. Mr. Lee, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. All right, so before we get to the traditional question one, uh, I am looking at my Dave Lee books, and uh, and they go from Dave Lee to your latest David Lee. So which one <laughs> Which one am I going to call you for the talk? Uh, call me Dave. Excellent. All right, then, Dave. Right. Question one, were you a weird kid? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'm, I, I also f- you know, I follow the weird kid theory of... Um, of magical involvement, definitely. So, such as? I mean, I'm going to ask you about some of the... Uh, well... Yeah, go for it. Um, just wanting just wanting different things. Wanting, if most people did, thing one, did something one way, I would want to do it the other, like the way that, you know, tying a bow in your shoelaces. I was told there was two ways, so I learned the other way. And um, writing that lent backwards and all that kind of thing when I was a little kid. All... You know, very silly stuff from an adult standpoint. And then more actually getting interested in weirdness as such, um, gradually finding weirder and weirder kind of literature until I stumbled into things like Lovecraft and so forth. So, yes, always, always the weirdness and liking SF and J.G. Ballard's The Voices of Time in my early teens, that kind of thing. Just anything that suggested that there was something beyond ordinary life so were you a uh, a product slash victim of a functional library system then oh yeah 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 <laughs> yeah we still have um, we still have a library system even though it's been eaten away um, in this country um it's nice it's all borrow it's all borrow books occasionally even order new books well, that's good. Uh, when I um, was speaking to Mog uh, a couple of years ago, he said he his local library, and this is in just you know South Wales, had uh, you know Crowley and so on. Uh, admittedly, behind glass, but here, like the, the <laughs> library system had uh, had high occultism. Uh, wow! Um, yeah, I, I've never seen. Uh such stuff on the shelves of the library, but no, then again, I've don't. never really looked, I suppose. <laughs> I tend to sort of assume that you've got to buy books like that. Well, but, because uh, they get stolen otherwise, so that I think that's yeah, it was probably clever yeah. of them to keep them a little bit yeah. locked away. But uh, cool. All right, so it was a, a general kind of sci-fi um, looking for the strange growing up. Mm. Did you come from a weird family, or were you the black sheep in these interests? I, yeah, I, I was very much, um, I was always looking for the weird. I mean, I think um, the family, I was, uh, I was adopted, the family was adopted into a lovely, but kind of very normal in many ways, and um, very kind of in the middle of things, you know. Uh, so, and having a very kind of normal wants, you know, and... That, I wanted to rebel against all of that, basically. And uh, in actually, in a number of your books, but uh, I noticed it most with the most recent one, um, you kind of encountered LSD reasonably early? Yeah, on my 18th birthday, yes, which was in 1969, so a long time ago. And was that, I mean... I get some of the impressions because there's a number of LSD stories in there that that was a um, that was a thing to go through on your uh, on your search for the weird. Oh, very much so. That was um, I I once when I'd heard, I first heard about LSD at about the age of fifteen and was already interested. Um, and by the time I was 16, 17, I was, you know, asking around. I didn't know anybody who'd got any. So, and then um, a little later, a friend of mine got some and gave me someone's birthday present. 
And what was that like? I mean, what was, was experience? Very one low like? dose. Okay. It, it was very low dose, but um, the, the, just as the story I told in the um, in Life Force about it, there was um, that particular incident. Um, it made me aware that the feeling of being in a body was a much much bigger thing than I'd ever known before. The feeling of being in in the flesh in a body was. And the energy, the feeling of energy within that was, was something I'd never really experienced before. Quite, that was quite amazing. The rest of it was pretty mild. Yeah, I, um, I wonder about the difference between, for me, like as a teenager, having done LSD and then other things that I would associate more with, you know, quote unquote, spirit work like psilocybin, uh, I think LSD is quite good in the very classic doors of perception sense where you where it's more about you and and the fact that you you fundamentally understand the uh, strictures of of human perception in a way that you know high doses of psilocybin or or DMT will get you the spirit work LSD is very much about you um i don't have quite that division i think I, i've got something similar to where you're coming from with that to me acid is very um it's kind of got a it's got a bright, empty feel. Um, so at the high dose level, it's quite good for losing the edge of self, just like psilocybin is. Um, but it's got, it doesn't feel like it's got inhabiting spirits, whereas psilocybin yeah. does. Yeah, I, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's the big distinction. In that respect, I find, um, I, I've tended to find acid easier. Less yeah. challenging, even though it can be very challenging. It's still you know, mushrooms are more challenging still because of that that sense of another that you have to respond to and form a relationship with. The um, the sort of perception of being in a body changing, I, I kind of resonated with me. My first experience, I think I was I wasn't eighteen. I might have been sixteen, and it was a classic sort of. Um, overnight drug party in a friend's house while their parents were away and my bodily perception i was aware that the brain was processing things and my consciousness was sort of separate to it if that makes sense like suddenly i realized that the body could do all this stuff that i was typically not aware of and i could move my awareness out of it or and it just kind of felt like computers going off mm -hmm. in the back of a room and and for me that's been i i quite enjoyed that was a useful step in realizing that when it comes to magic uh you do need some sort of physical praxis because that's just the realities of being embodied at the moment was well, so it it sounds like also that was an introduction for you to a, vi a vivid introduction to the observer position as it were to that that sense of being a, you know a, a split being one part of you observing another part absolutely um funny yeah. enough, we're gonna have we're gonna have questions about that but is, we'll, we'll talk about it now dave okay. what is the um observer self slash position well um i think it's something that i think most people find very easy to access actually if you just simply become aware of what you're doing or what you're what you're feeling then you are observing some aspect of your your own state um this you can even become aware of your thoughts as, as, as if you're kind of outside of them you've objectified them to some extent and then that's that comes with persistent meditation i think with persistent contemplation sitting contemplation or maybe it comes with other ex forms of exercise as well i think in any case it is um helped along by doing doing magic doing anything that makes you step outside of your um, unquestioning sense of identity yeah, my um, my most profound earliest experience of it was during a past life regression where I'd kind of moved past me and as I was being guided into uh, other lives that I'd suppressed, it was a... It was a self, but it wasn't Gordon, and uh, and and that was yeah. really really interesting. Uh, what I like about the book, and I, we'll we'll talk about this now. One of the many things is um, there is you you kind of contend, and I think it's correct that well, let's look, I'll back it up. There is something in the metaphysics of um, say holotropic breathing, uh, Jungian depth psychology. Uh, other forms of magic. I mean, I, I, 
I don't think the Holy Guardian Angel approach is, is it's more of a cul-de-sac in, in, in Western history. But nevertheless, we, when you look at these kind of therapeutic systems, it relies on some kind of uh, self or being that is not your conscious self that is in some way either interacting or guiding the process. So um, Dr. Groff has the holotropic mind, yeah. for instance. So do you think that's like, – how do you conceptualize that? And do you think that is um, – and what's its relation to an observer self? Well, I don't, I don't have um, – a. I don't have an absolutely certain conceptualization of that. It's something I keep, I think about and think about again. Um, I think it's important to, I don't use the term higher self, which of course mm -hmm. is one of the terms that some people use for something very similar to what you're talking about, isn't it? <clears throat> um, because that implies that whatever this higher consciousness is, that it's like a self and it's not really. It's not really like a self. Some people call it the self with a big S. Um, that's fine as long as we understand what we're talking about. But to me, it's not very much like a self. It's it's much, much, much bigger than a self. And it doesn't have a self is basically an organ for survival. The ego is an organ for survival. Um, it's it's something that's in the service of the will of the body to survive, basically. Uh, whereas this thing we're calling, not calling higher self, that we might call holy guardian angel, which I agree with Crowley that the one good reason to use that phrase is because it's so absurd. Yeah. And, um, or we might call it other things. But it is, it's not self-like. It's much more expansive. And it's like, it's like a sort of urgrund, you know. It's like something that actually underlies everything else. It's a... It's the ground of consciousness itself, and I think that becomes quite apparent too with persistent contemplation. It is related to the observer self. It's not the same thing. I'm a little bit chary of using the term observer self as well. I tend to prefer that. I mean, I do use it, but I tend to prefer, and being more rigorous, the term observer position because it's observer self is a bit ontological, implying that there's kind of like some little office up in your head where this thing happens, you know, somebody sitting there with a desk kind of thing and a bunch of screens. But um, I don't see it like that at all. It's that somehow the mind on the spur of the moment makes up an observer and an observed. That's how it seems to me. And the awareness of that process, the beginnings of the awareness of that process that comes with prolonged contemplation is the beginnings of the awareness of um, the bigger picture, the, the soul in the Jungian sense or the, the self with a big S or whatever you want to call it. It's always interested me uh, that, and this is, I found it, you know, being that you've written one of the classics of Chaos Magic, it was just an absolute breath of fresh air to get that. Um, obviously, I resonate with it, but but to get that kind of um, rigorous, cool, multi-model uh, analysis of what's going on, because it's always interested me that people rarely look at what is a fundamental metaphysical position when it comes to things like depth psychology or breath work, which we'll um, get to that there's no reason why this should do the things it, it, it should. Like, that's the kind of weird thing yeah. in, in Jung's universe, yeah. the fact that you will do some active imagination exercises, essentially talk to things in your head, and your entire life will fundamentally transform. And people, like, uh, and rightly so, they're very interested in, in, in the effects of that and, and how it can improve one's existence. But there's a metaphysical statement beforehand, which is there is something about bringing thoughts to the surface or going into this process that fundamentally transforms reality that people really look at. And, and it's here that we get that, you know, observer position, holotropic mind mm, yeah. interaction. And, uh, and everyone kind of more often than not is having the discussions downstream, but there's a big metaphysical kind of implication right at the front of it. I, I agree. I mean, there's either two very interesting different things going on here, or the two things I'm about to talk about are actually different angles on the same thing. First of all, there is, it seems as if the, the, the bringing something up to the gaze of the, uh, of the observer self, the observer position, is in itself healing. It's as if, I, I've experienced this so many times with breath work, you get to some painful place and you simply watch the discomfort 
the pain, you, you, your breath with the breath, you know how to control the intensity of that. You simply watch it cycle after cycle after cycle, usually no more than 20 minutes, sometimes more like an hour, can be even longer. But um, quite often it's quite a short cycle, but it can be very intense. And as a result of that, just observing that and drawing close to it and eventually deciding that it's no longer threatening, no longer so, something that you've got to reject, incredible healing happens. What I find interesting, and we were sort of talking about this uh, when we were arranging the call, was one of the things about breathwork that I thought was an unusual match, and it kind of speaks to the metaphysics underlying it that um, probably needs some examination, is you will not be necessarily consciously aware of um, which part of the body has a pain point or what kind of... Uh, memory or experience that is associated with and, and, and you go through it. So the interaction there, not only is there some kind of, you know, holotropic mind that knows better than your physical self, uh, which thing to look for. But what fascinates me about that is it's matched to active imagination where to begin the process, you start with an image of whatever it happens to be that you're going to be, uh, using to go into that sort of Jungian process. But if anything moves in that image, you follow it. And that's the mm -hmm. beginning of the process. And it just seemed like uh, that shouldn't work either. Like, it, not only do these things have profound therapeutic effects, but who who makes the bunny in the, in the fields or the picture of the forest move that you follow uh, that results in some kind of <laughs> therapeutic benefit no, at the end I of it? It's it's something that is not conscious mind, and it's yeah, it's it's something a lot deeper, and that doesn't normally that doesn't speak in words. What you just picked up there about the um, um, Jungian guided imagery kind of stuff, path working style stuff, and the way that can be useful and can you can get therapeutic breakthroughs through that. That is partly to do with stuff surfacing. It is definitely to do with stuff surfacing and bringing it into the the light of observer in a sense. But there's also an element, particularly with that kind of thing where you're constructing a new narrative you're allowing stuff to surface <clears throat> and then you're you're telling yourself how it fits into your life so as it becomes conscious <clears throat> it takes its place in a narrative which has already got certain elements that you've put in there like for the path working for the guide the guided imaginative thing so in a way that's the other side of what i was talking about on the one hand there's the influence of the observer observer position which in in itself seems to be healing it's almost like just watching something you're giving it permission to sort itself out and on the other hand there's also the fact that you're constructing a narrative about something which has previously been in a dark corner yeah so for me i guess I, I haven't formed a, a satisfactory opinion of um or position around these underlying metaphysics but it, it does sort of suggest a kind of chaos magic heuristic which is more or less to haunt the world like Jung's sort of goal was to make the entirety of his unconscious conscious and to me that <laughs> process kind of reminds me of which I sometimes describe myself as as the, the EPA agent in the original Ghostbusters film who makes them shut down and, and open their ghost container and just haunts New York like <laughs> uh, like I don't really know what's going on but it, it seems to me that the direction is more in a kind of metaphoric haunting than in a de-haunting so a sort of re-enchantment mm. uh, rather than a disenchantment and that's as close as i can get because i find this um none of these things well i mean magic shouldn't work we're about to talk about chaos magic but like in particular the way we typically refer to ourselves even within a majority of magical systems doesn't satisfactorily provide a metaphysics for how something like this could work no i agree there isn't there isn't an absolutely satisfactory metaphysics for for magical events for vivid synchronicities of that kind i mean this this is something i've, I've covered you know I, I not having an explanation for i at least um chunked into a model in uh, um a chapter of bright from the well i talk about levels of weirdness Basically, it's, you know, some types of magical effect or event you can get fairly close to looking at with some kind of a scientific view. You could more or less interface them with science and others you simply cannot. It just doesn't, it doesn't go. 
Yeah. So um, when did you, let's go back to the biography stuff. I mean, so you always had an interest in, in the weird and sci-fi and then uh, mm-hmm. had some interesting uh, LSD experiences. When did you first hear the term chaos magic? And, uh, and was that the first kind of occult system you landed on? It was pretty much the first cult system I I, um, I landed on because um, I in my LSD days, my late teens, I'd, uh, um, I I read an article about Alistair Crowley and I thought, oh, it sounds like an interesting person, but um, I was really put off by all the fancy Golden Dawn names, all those sort of names of a you know Adeptus Minor and Adeptus Major and all that and Ipsissimus. I I thought, my God, these people are living in some pretentious 19th century fantasy. You know, I couldn't get over the sense that there was something completely outdated about it. And um, so I wasn't at all interested in magic. The only um, mystical thing that I that I had any time for in my early 20s before I took up magic, just between my acid days and my magic days when I was getting a science degree at the time, was um, Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching, the idea of a sort of, you know, kind of ineffable basis to the universe. I was quite okay with that. But the magical thing, no. But it wasn't until I moved to Leeds in 1976, I took up um, transcendental meditation for relaxation because I was interested in it. Somebody had said something interesting about it. Went along and paid my cash and got my mantra and meditated a couple of times a day. And I, you know, it's an introduction to sitting meditation of a not completely untraditional sort. And but then that went on. You know, I wanted some some stronger stronger meat after that. And. Um, I ended up uh, colliding with a bunch of people who called themselves the Occult Group at the Leeds University Union. I was a postgraduate student there. And uh, there was also a bookshop opposite the university. Um, I've forgotten the name of it. It doesn't long since not exist. It's a second-hand bookshop. It always seemed to have a few magic books in it. And um, I got a copy of Lieber Null. I'd actually first heard of it via Chris Bray at the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Started going along there. Um, the occult supply shop in Leeds, which is really one of the reasons why Chaos Magic took off so forcibly in Yorkshire, was because of the presence of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, I think, uh, which provided uh, a meeting space from time to time. So I got in there and talked with the proprietor and saying, oh, this book is you know, a new magical current. And then I found it in the second-hand shop, really. And I thought, my God, this is, this is all right. This is okay. This is not. This does not require you to sacrifice um, your intellectual grasp of the world on the altar of a desire for power, which it seemed to me at the time that you know, more traditionalist magical views did. Uh, certainly religious ones and, um, you know, ones with uh, that kind of a spirit metaphysic. I was not ready for that at all. So Chaos Magic, from someone who came from a sceptical science background, absolutely super, just the job. Nice one. And was it sort of off to the races? Did you just um, dive into MMM or did you um, find those strange weirdos who, you know, wrote it and, and published it and said, what's going on here? Well, it was a bit of both, actually, and a bit of a bit of other things as well. I, I've actually detailed some of my early um, magical life on the IoT blog. There's another issue that just come out, just tiny little snippets from those days. But um, I I met with a bunch of people in Sheffield University Students Union, this occult group. They handed out a leaflet about a meeting, and I met with them. And um, there's some nice people there. I'm still in touch, as it happens, with two of them um, who did continue to explore magic in other contexts. That meeting was all about the teachings, as it turned out, of a particular dodgy guru, a chap who called himself the Master Amado and claimed to be the son of Alistair Crowley. But um, he was really not very interesting, ultimately, except in as much as he brought this bunch of people together. And so a few of us did start to experiment with other things. Um, but there wasn't really anybody who seemed to be at that stage keen on experimenting with the Lieber Null stuff. I tried out, a, you know, I had a go at a few sigils and had started having the odd success. And then via the Sorcerer's Apprentice um, meetup, Saturday morning meeting occasions, I met um, 
Ray Sherwin and eventually Pete Carroll, who wrote respectively the Book of Results and Liber Null, which were the two books that came out in 1978 that really crystallised chaos magic. It's it kind of in, some of the ideas have been floating around for a few years, but I think that really crystallised it into a particular current. And um, I mean, Sherwin and was invited up to his place in East Morton. Oh, that's in West Yorkshire, just outside Bradford, and uh, a few other people were, and gradually we got a group together. And um, so, uh, obviously, I mean, we'll talk about the the kind of growing awareness that it probably works. I find, I think, everyone who's sort of stuck more or less with chaos magic in some way has that story of kind of again, it's. Um, it's a slow burn change to your metaphysics when you realize that, oh, so these sigils things, they work. <laughs> That's weird. Uh, and for me, what I find interesting is <laughs> how like people find chaos magic and, and discover that the universe is, um, shall we say, bigger, like bigger than what you had previously thought it was going to be. But for you, you ended up... Um, a, having kind of much more of a long running relationship with um northern systems so like what was it about uh northern mythological and magical systems that you found so resonant and 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 how did that journey how did you get from chaos magic to that that took quite a long time actually nearly you know, nearly 20 years of um of doing magic, which is basically chaos magic, and well, you know, obviously dabbling in and dabbling in a few paradigms, as we cheekily called them. But of course, you know, traditional bits of traditional systems taken out and used out of context, um, and which can, of course, work and produce marvelous results on all sorts of levels. But I really began to want to get deep into a tradition, and I started to recognise that desiring myself before I got specifically into the northern tradition. So I was I was really looking around at the stuff that I got the deepest respect for, that I'd worked with and had some of the deepest experiences with. Um, I liked um, Voudon quite a bit. I liked the I Ching. Um, and there was various other various other bits of magic that I thought, hmm, yeah, that that would be something to get deep into. But if you're going to get deep into the chain, I think you've got to probably go to China for a few years and learn Mandarin. And uh, if you're going to get deep into Voodoo, you've got to get into an initiatic lineage. So, and then I started to think, well, what about, what, you know, where, where is the depth in the culture that I'm from? Uh, the Northwest European culture. Um, so, or one of those you know, groups of cultures, that mishmash of cultures, um, English being a Germanic language. So, how does that factor in? Now, where can we start with the language? And some friends of mine have been involved in um, the Rune Guild for a while. And I went to see um, Edred Thornton speak when he spoke for the first time in, in England in 1995, summer 1995. And I went to see him. and. South London, Charlton House, and I was impressed by the initiatic sophistication of the system he had construed from the um, the old documents from the old the old ideas. And this was not Odinism, you know, it wasn't uh, um, some religious revivalist type thing at all. It was an initiatic system um, aiming at you know, aiming at full magical initiation, uh, tire consciousness. And uh, it, I thought, wow, yes, this is, this is for me. So I took up the, you know, the daily practice of the Nine Doors, the, scheme, the work scheme of the Rune Guild in January 1996. So, yes, it was about 19 years since I'd, about 19, 20 years since I'd actually started doing magic. But yes, it's it's added a whole other dimension to my magical practice and my understanding of what magic is. I think um, if people stick with it long enough, chaos magic, in 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 a weird sense, is um, well, I've previously called it something like Atlanta Airport, where it's it's a place you kind of necessarily move through to get to where you're going, uh, because oh, yeah. it yeah. has. Um, the sort of meta model approach, which is looking at different models, uh, 
the the position you have to take to assume a meta model approach is itself a position that is not of i think like sufficient psychological or, or cultural depth to to live in so it works very mm. well for navigation but by virtue of being a meta model it's also necessarily incomplete and there's some really interesting stuff going on in anthropology about this so um uh, Eduardo Viveros de, de Castro talks about things like the relative native. So it's what happens. There's a, there's an anthropological mindset, however much you try to do participant observation, that gets in the way when you're there in 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 South America. And and the relative native is about how you are supposed to um, navigate between that mindset and and the mindset of a native, because otherwise you are the one doing the you're still colonizing, you're still doing the capture and, and description of it, and there's something about that that's resonant with a meta model. It is the least worst way of navigating practical experimentation in magic, but it's just not satisfactory as a psychological or mythological system. Yeah, it's um, with, I think, the thing that, that chaos magic, that, that kind of pick and mix level of chaos magic shows you is that you can get magic out of anything. I mean, the most superficial and probably historically inaccurate or downright wrong representations of other traditional systems, you can still get results from them. You might not get the very finest results in certain ways. You certainly probably wouldn't want to work like that consistently. <laughs> but, you know, for one one afternoon or one night where you decide you're going to do this ritual, you're going to take on the belief that you're a particular type of magician from, I don't know, some obscure tantric school or, you know, some Celtic myth or whatever, and do that. And like I say, it can be completely wrong. You get results. This leads us towards the notion that, in fact, you can get results in magic from fiction. But like, actually, Kenneth Grant pointed that out. I think he, well, that Kenneth Grant's input into the chaos current was his work with H.P. Lovecraft, showing that you can take completely fictional entities and actually get magical results from them. Although it's, you know, it, it, it probably took quite a few years for that to come through because Grant's writing is so confusing. But um, it's, uh, you know, so eventually you're getting to the idea that we script reality and that our scripting of reality is fiction, like the William Burroughs apocalypse thing. You know, it's all illusion, dream, art. So magic, actually, once you've shown that to yourself, magic gets rather easier. It, it gets easier, but I um, here's the bit that has been my experience from a couple of decades of chaos magic, is um, it, it gets easier in the short term. So it's almost like the, the first realization needs to be that you can... Um, achieve results in a in a kind of like system independent way, but you get better results. Uh, well, at least it's been my experience and other people's. You whilst you can summon Superman, you get better results summoning Apollo, uh, and that is. But funnily enough, realizing that is almost a chaos magic. Um, experimental outcome anyway, which is I'm if I'm looking to maximize results, I start with the idea that anything can work and then I kind of test which things work the best and then I sort of optimize for them. And uh, and I find it interesting that there isn't too much people will do the kind of classic chaos magic thing for the first couple of years or however long it happens to be. But eventually you um if you're doing it correctly there's almost an experiential understanding that you um, better stuff can be derived from Apollo than from Superman. Oh, absolutely. I mean, but of course, then you, you have to study Apollo. You have to have formal relationship with Apollo, don't you? So I'm talking about two very different levels of magic here. Yep. There's, there's, and they're both, they might both be in the same magical act. There's a level at which everything is fiction and you're simply making up some story. But there's the level at which you realize the godlike nature of doing that. And that is what I get. I mean, I'm totally agreeing with you. I'm not, not, uh, um, I'm not advocating that that sort of approach is a, you know, a sort of shallow approach as a means of getting, uh, of doing better at magic because ultimately that is merely a technical insight. Whereas a more intimate insight for me is realizing that Woden is the core of my consciousness, that Woden is the script writer, the god behind the gods. So, um, 
I can do any kind of a spell using all the stuff I've learned from chaos magic. And it's at a certain point, I might be briefly aware that in a certain sense I am, or I am a little, you know, I am Woden or something like Woden. I like that. I like the um, the technical insight analysis because um, the meta model works for, um, funnily enough, everything except potentially what's the most important thing in, in the world. And it almost comes back to that, um, underlying metaphysic for how things like breath work and, and depth psychology, particularly depth psychology, I guess. Like, I mean, Jung kind of with his classic sort of collective unconscious and archetypes model sort of realized that there are scripts in the universe, if you will, that, uh, alignment with your exploration of kind of deepens your experience of, of yourself and, and reality. And that's the one bit that, um, in the short term, people may miss in a meta model, but if they stick with it, they'll end up kind of realizing like the, the technical insight and optimization path of of chaos magic's experience of, of practical enchantment will eventually get you there. You will eventually kind of realize, okay, well, this is a component that I that is required, and uh, and I find I just find it interesting looking at the vectors that people in. Um, chaos magic who i who both stay in it and end up with an additional almost like a resting belief system (laughs) uh like yeah i find it really interesting to watch the vectors of people over over the decades and 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 where they end up and i think in aggregate that says something about the approach yeah i think that it's um it's an approach that ultimately is translucent it's a good mixer yeah that's a, it's a good mix. <laughs> All right. So, um, in a, in a, in the kind of funny way of these things, uh, life force, um, I encountered life force, uh, around the same time I kind of realized I needed to do a series of a sporadic series of talks on energy and, and energy models, because in the classic chaos magic sense, I'm more or less down on them because the way they, they're kind of explored most commonly in magic is with a kind of 19th century early days of electricity understanding. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I don't think that's very satisfactory. Uh, and this book showed up at a really good time. Uh, and it was again, uh, just a breath of fresh air to have someone, uh, both explore the sort of implications of an energy model and actually really rigorously unpack, uh, the limitations of uh, of talking about it this way. So, um, I mean, how do you define, or how do you, when you're not in practice, how do you define quote unquote energetics? And when you are in practice, what kind of assumptions do do we go with? <laughs> okay. Um, when I'm practicing, I have a fairly a fairly rich. I attempt a fairly rich immersion, a fairly deep immersion in a belief in energy um, like, I'll give you an example actually, a friend of mine who I've worked with magically has training in Reichian psychotherapy so he's completely been you know, he's he's been completely sort of steeped and boiled in the whole Reichian universe and uh, he showed me how to uh, kind of get in a group of people and sit there's the chaos wrong thing that I write about in the book. It's a group of people and simply start to, you, you have to imagine for a short while, it's like a visualization, that you're in training energy that already exists in the environment, that you're drawing it up through your feet and out through the top of your head or through your hands or whatever, and you're forming structures with it. Now, um, this... Yeah, so I, I try and step completely into that kind of feeling that I'm living in this continuum of buzzing energy. Uh, when I come out of that, then then I'm in part five of the book, really, which is pretty sceptical. Yeah. <laughs> it was, um, funnily enough, years ago when I was first sort of experimenting with these kind of audio conversations in a pre-podcast world, I was talking to Nikki and Julian, and um, one mm. of the things we were idly speculating on whether is whether there is a personality type and this is why the majority of the kind of western magical world is so dismissive of chaos magic is when 
I sort of move belief systems for whatever reasons, for ritual or what have you. I really do it. Like, I, I mean it. I actually believe that at the time. And I was talking to Nikki about it, and she's the same. It's like, if I say I'm that, like, it's it's not it's not an act. I'm not playing a character. Like, my, my beliefs change for the duration of it. And I wonder if that's just a personality type that uh, – some people can do that and some people can't. And there's this sort of permanent divide because I can understand how it looks if you're not as fluid with belief systems. But I heard that as just completely mm-hmm. lucid and clear. And because I, I can do that, I, I can actually move belief systems and literally believe it for that evening and then come back out of it. And I just wonder, like, it's it's one of these things, I think there needs to be an anthropology of chaos magic or sociology of it to find out what our personality <laughs> types are. That would be really interesting because one of the things that interests that, I agree, that is interesting. And there's another division which may be not unrelated, and that is between people who believe that an inner plane structure, something like, you know, gods, angels, archangels, et cetera, et cetera, um, inner planes, contacts, all of that stuff has got genuine power. You can actually draw power down from it. One of the most impressive magicians I know in terms of his effects on the world perhaps although you know he, he he works like this but then again he's he's someone who works in a lot of different and strange ways i'm only just beginning to try and understand how how, how people work like this how people can take what is essentially an incredibly outdated neoplatonic view of the world and parlay it into a genuine transmission of magical power now a lot of people when you talk about the majority you know the chaos magic is is I've forgotten what we term was held in contempt or something by the majority of the um, of the magical world. The majority of the magical world, I think, is still quite like that. Though mm. those that are on that side, um, for instance, what does it mean to gain initiation in a lineage such as Thelema, um, such as uh, you know Crowley's lineage, and all the sort of like all the splits that have occurred in there, but there's still an idea that you can plug into something. If you've got a genuine initiatic lineage, you can plug into something, and it's like a ready-made source of energy or magical power. Now, I find that much, much harder to step into, that kind of belief, than a belief in energy. Um yeah, I've never successfully, I've never managed to hold that kind of belief for long enough to get a decent magical results from it. But do you think that's because you have satisfied that by plugging into a mythological system that matches sort of landscape and and culture? So you've you've plugged into the wall. You've just plugged into like a because I I find that's been my case. I, I well, a Kolu lineage is in, in if you're going to talk lineages, there are actual ones that you know go back. Again, we were talking about Vodun and so on. So that you've got proper lineages in, in ATRs, and if that's your kind of experience, you know, or, or interest, go for them. But I wonder if you haven't or if you haven't got an authenticity plug in the wall anyway, and it's just not Crowley for the same reason it isn't for me. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe that's it. That's, it, it's, I don't even have, I can't imagine what it's like to feel yeah. so <laughs> utterly energetically alive in terms of your magical energy, if your actual, you know, your, vital, whoa, your actual vital oomph to feel like that about a magical current. You know, this friend of mine does. Mm. And that's what he gets off the name of, basically. He, he, he has a particular personal non-OTO cosmic vision version of the name of, and he actually seems to be able to channel power out of it. And I, I find this completely puzzling. Yeah, I understand that. That's, um, I think we can all play this, some of my best friends of Thelemite's game. But for me, mm-hmm. like the, the Neoplatonic model, there's a personality type component to it as well, which is be, needing to put things in little boxes in, in a way that I... Uh, um, I don't resonate with in my actual life, uh, <laughs> in my kind of messy life. But there just seems if if people are, I hate to use the term wired. It's not correct, but it does seem to me that at some stage we'd need to do a kind of more interesting sociology or or anthropology of, of Western magic mm. that has a kind of um, has some fairly rigorous psychology behind it because. Uh, it would not surprise me at all. If things like uh, political positions are more or less determined by things like personality type, then there's probably something interesting in 
in uh, why it is p- people resonate with with different systems, and I expect it would. Um, mm-hmm. I expect some insight could be drawn from it. I I, I think also you know, it would be very interesting to research the split along the lines of how people use spirit paradigm, how people use the spirit model of magic. That's related, but not the same as the kind of you know. Um, traditional metaphysics I was just sort of saying that I I didn't really get. I do get the spirit paradigm. I have had some successes working with spirits. It's not a natural one. It seems quite a a big step to go from science education. It's a little step to go from science education to energy magic, but it's a big step to go from science education to spirit magic, I think. Mm, I think it's a necessary one too. I mean, that's um, my... I quote in that quote somewhere. It might... Go for it. That's your something you're really good at, though, isn't it? I mean, in your book, I've got your book, Chaos Protocols, and I really enjoyed it. And a couple of the things that I took away from it was, okay, yes, I need to work on my spirit magic a bit more because here's someone who's very clearly expressing the benefits of certain kinds of spirit magic. Well, I think that's the piece. I mean, you know, you had a science education. Pete had a science education. Uh, it, it's net like. It's expected that the first several decades of of chaos magic would be um, influenced by either the personality types that go into a science education or the the learnings that come out of it, and I think that's quite clear in in Pete's kind of you know dizzying physics that's uh, that's in his <laughs> books. Um, what's been interesting, and I kind of said this to him, what's been interesting. Chaos Magic came of age, if you will, or at least existed, prior to some really interesting information about research that was going on that was people were unaware of in the 80s, it's sort of like mid-90s on, and a lot of that has been the kind of collation of NDEs and, 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 and consciousness research, some of which was, you know, being done by the CIA without our, you know, knowledge. And those are the pieces that need to be sort of shook. <laughs> to see what comes out. What um, what what kind of research are you are you referring to? Well, um, when it comes to the NDE stuff, we're kind of if you haven't really looked at oh NDE, I think you said N B E. I was no, just no, mishearing. No. So no, that would yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty <laughs> weird. That's a bit Grant Morrison. Um, yeah. Well, just in general, you look at it and go, okay, so these uh, I I kind of thought my way this is bizarre but it's a 21st century thing right i kind of literally logicked my way to a spirit model as my home base uh because mm. there's no other way for me to put together the the range of uh anomalous phenomena that have at least some reality behind them although we don't know what it is that has been kind of collated and examined and 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 so on over the last 120 years and and that Coming together of anomalous data, I mean, Fort did his best in the early 20th century, has really only mm. happened in a satisfactory way in the last couple of decades. So, yeah, for me, okay. I ended up in a, um, you, you know, my version of the Northern tradition is is uh, some kind of um, high Middle Age haunted Catholic animism at the moment, because I'm trying <laughs> to work out what... Beautiful phrase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What what culture and 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 the very likely reality that um, at least some spirits have a have an entirely separate ontology to to us, how that all fits with uh, with the chaos magic suspicion of everything. I mean, I I, I think this is a tremendously exciting area of philosophy basically mm. um you know, the whole the, the discussion the whole thing i mean some people say oh it's just a personal thing you know it's just one person and another person but no i think it's a really important thing um there's in my <laughs> i don't there are some experiences i've had on my weirdness scale of five in right from the well i talk about when my girlfriend levitated um I, only very, you know, not long after I'd first got into magic. Um, and I've never found a reasonable explanation on any level for that. That seems to me just a complete and utter flagrant violation of every model of the universe I've ever seriously considered. Um, the only one it isn't a flagrant violation of is something like a pure information model, so like a matrix type of model where you've, where reality is that flimsy in a certain sense um my my model for 
practically everything, I suppose, is a sort of, um, I don't know, freak science illuminism, something like that. I like that. It's, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I basically think that, you know, I'm, that the project of awakening yourself is the most important thing. The project of higher consciousness is the most important thing. Although I would dispute the term higher, it's the one that most people will use. The project of conscious growth of some sort is the most important thing. Um, once one has achieved some perspectives through prolonged contemplation, certain perspectives about how things are, like the idea that there is underlying mental, mental underlying consciousness, Way, you know, that's much vaster than the little self, then magic gets, a lot of magic gets very easy to understand on that model. But, um, you know, that things are a hell of a lot more connected than they appear to be. I think David Bohm was, you know, the physicist, the uh, prize-winning physicist was getting quite close to a model of, of you always start from connectedness. You don't start from separation, even though you do experiments in science that require the utmost and the most refined form of separation in order to get results. You always consider those results from the point of view of the whole. That was the model he was trying to build with some degree of success, although he, you know, it's very tangled stuff to read. But anyway, my model of the universe is a little bit like that. I like freak science illuminism. I can see the kid who was reading science fiction in that. I think that's uh, yeah, yeah. that's a good way of talking about it. Um, speaking of talking about things, let's um, you you kind of and I agree one hundred percent. And you kind of open the book with this. I thought it was very pleasant. Uh, the the higher self term implies a a sort of neoplatonic directionality that can is a double. Uh, is a double wrong or a double risk? Uh, and uh, so for me, I thought the book opened really, really strong with um, the discussion of toxic dualism. And uh, and what is toxic mm. dualism, Dave? Well, basically, um, we some of the horror of the culture that we inhabit is down to the the, the Cartesian division, a uh, rigid Cartesian division of experience into mind and body, and. Mind is, of course, Descartes was coming from essentially a religious position. He was trying to get a scientific handle on religious ideas to some extent. So his idea of mind is really spirit or God, you know, or really spirit. Um, so inevitably, it's better than body. It's superior to body. Body is just like the sort of embarrassing relative that you drag around for a you know, for 70 years, um, that whole kind of Christian, vile Christian model of existence. And that has, that even when we manage to escape culturally to some extent from the nastiness of Christianity, we're, we're, we're stuck in something equally nasty, which is this idea that we're a ghost in a machine. This gives us a really rotten relationship with our own bodies, and this gives us, this cuts off access to wisdom, which we can obtain from within, um, and it makes us... It gives us an excuse to treat animals as if they don't feel pain. There's all sorts of destructive features to that dualism. And uh, it, I think it was a necessary way to to open the book, given that it's a Chaos Magician's book about um, breathwork, which has a underlying energy model. So it's a really useful way of kind of going, okay, well, from this, from the first step, if you haven't thought about this again coming back to the underlying metaphysics you might be heading off in in a direction that isn't going to be helpful but um one of the things that really cleared this up for me because i hadn't done uh, connected breath work up until the last couple of days with the youtube videos that you share at the end of the book and so on where i can kind of oh, okay. do like a 20 breath thing but i had done years ago uh holotropic stuff and it was uh interesting to get uh so uh, let me uh, let me do it this way. So we'll, we'll we'll open the discussion on breathwork by having you describe what the breathwork polarity is. Okay. Um, in the course of the book, I introduce well, it's basically nine different types of breathwork. I mean, there are two that are there's ten, but there's two that are essentially technically identical, but they just come from different traditions. And some of those types of breathwork are 
The, the, the kinds of breath work that most people know about are the relaxing pranayamas. It's sort of like you know, your doctor, if it's a pretty enlightened sort of doctor, might say, look, just learn how to breathe. Take this disc home. It's got like a, a click track on it or something and learn how to breathe to this sort of rhythm. Um, that's a much more sophisticated version of that is that it, it exists as a book that you can get with a CD to help you do these things. This is really, really good stuff for simulating your parasympathetic nervous system so you can learn to relax and calm down. This will reduce the um, stress wear on your whole system, basically. A lot of people are stressed out these days. Um, this will reduce the wear on your system, enable you to get back to pleasant states of consciousness more quickly, enable you to make the best of your time, you know, digest your food better and all of these things that give you a better, relaxed physical life. Now, there's a number of of you know Indian pranayama and one Taoist technique that one Taoist type of breathing I go into that so that's, that's all to do with that really it's all to do with or at least it can be used for that it may not be all to do with that original you know Patanjali's yoga sutras but it's um, because of course they're always aiming at a spiritual transformation but it can be used to just have a better life and this there is other the just to interrupt like this is yeah, this sorry. end of the spectrum is where people who are magically operant would be most familiar with the idea of breath work because it is that kind of um regular slow breathing breathe out kind of guided meditation yeah. breathing so when people who are magically operant think breath work they're thinking this end of the spectrum right away I certainly am. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, a relaxing breath work. It's uh, breathing from your abdomen and breathing slowly is a very highly efficient way of oxygenating your system so you don't have to breathe as much. You can breathe slower, you can calm down. Yeah, so that is that is where most people... If you pick up most decent books on magical training, there'll be something on breath work. There'll be something on how to sit still, how to breathe, and under, you know to feel the current of your breath and to evaluate the sensations that arise from it, etc. All your decent... You know, there'll be... That'll be You've come across things like that. I mean, Crowley's written, written wrote instructions like that. Lieber Null by Pete Carroll has got instructions like that. Um, and you'll have come across, yeah, basically nice slow pranayama, good and relaxing, and it's good for concentration. Um, as long as you don't let the breath get so shallow that you go to sleep, then it will improve your concentration. However, there are also types of breath that... You're not advised to use all the time, and in fact, all the best result, you know, all the best advice on them is, oh, you know, don't use this all the time, or even don't use this unless you've got an instructor. Um, I, I lump three of those together in the book: uh, breath of fire, um, couple of bati. Uh, anyway, those, all, all of those really strong, those really intense breaths, and bellows breath. All of those really intense breaths, they produce stimulation they can produce dizziness they're not a million miles from holotropic breathwork of course which is actually hyperventilation a lot of it is hyperventilation although i think there is a case for accepting that some holotropic workers call it superventilation to distinguish from distinguish it from the hyperventilation which of course indicates a medical emergency so this is like hyperventilation but not in a bad way um and basically what that produces is all sorts of things like titanic cramping um, and so forth in its extreme forms. And, it, you know, it, it produces massive discomfort and throwing up of amazing, you know, amazingly good for getting deep material to come up. So this is what those really intense breath works are like. And the breath work that I'm most trained in, uh, connected breath work under the vivation brand is a, a little bit like holotropic but a little bit less confrontational we do teach the client how not to go over the over the top in hyperventilation if, if they don't want to so um but basically those are at that end so the spectrum the polarity is between things that relax you and things that really pump things up and get things moving that will cause you to have perhaps more magical energy that maybe will cause you to resurge deep and uncomfortable patterns and memories and will generally disrupt your life and they're not supposed to be used all the time it's uh, so connected breath work is very much a uh, a therapeutic system where you're either doing it for energy or you're doing it because it's coming back to Jung and active imagination it's a way of uh it's it's a psychological for want of a better word um therapy uh so like oh i need i, I have some stuff i need to explore or i think my life will be better if i can kind of you bring yeah. this stuff up to the light it's it's for that kind of thing 
in, in a very broad sense, you could call it a bodywork therapy thing. Yeah, it's not all done for therapy. And we, I wasn't trying. I mean, I've got training. I've got a certification in vivation, but I don't regard myself as a therapist. It's more of a coach. I mean, I don't have any of the, you know, the deeper psychological training that would enable me to, set, you know, to claim that I was a psychotherapist. I'm not. But the process certainly for a lot of people has, you know, mainly a therapeutic dimension. You kind of cover this in the book, but uh, there is a, and it's happening interestingly in in other fields that, should they so decide, can use the T word, um, but it does seem like it's a, a necessary but insufficient description. So I'm thinking particularly of something like astrology, where um, if you're looking for something you'll never get, which is kind of like mainstream legitimacy, you can say, oh, it's a form of therapy. <laughs> and you go, well, it has therapeutic effects, but the, the reality is it's it's magic. Like, we, we just, we don't have the word in, in common parlance for yes. yeah. the yeah. cascade of, yeah. yes, you can, it does this, but it also does this. So if you, if we spoke Mongolian and, and lived in, you know, um, central Eurasia, there'd be better words for the, the totality of, of why someone would do something like connected breath work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. It, it's ne- some aspects of it may be made respectable, but then, of course, that the other as- then the wild edge will be left to um, the chaos magicians and so forth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, which is fine. Cool. Um, so you you mentioned vivation. So connected breath work, uh, as I understand it, slash have had experimented with it the last couple of days with uh, the twenty breath um, on on YouTube. Is okay. um, is genuine? Like, describe it. What even is connected breath work? Then it's a way of breathing. Well, for a start, the connected bit means you breathe continuously. You, you probably most people are probably not aware that people who've done no breath work at all probably not aware that we stop breathing a lot. We pause our breathing a lot. We either sort of pause it after we've breathed out or we hold it a bit after we've breathed in or we hold it somewhere on the up or down. Um, we do this because we're talking, obviously, because we then, you know, we need to modulate the flow of the breath through the vocal cords. But we also do it when we're thinking. We sub-vocalize and that interrupts our breathing patterns. And we do it for all sorts of other reasons. We do it for emotional reasons all the time. We lock the breath. This is why we are breathing continuously because that is one of the things that will trigger therapeutic changes is the fact that you're no longer stopping and locking the breath because one thing that children learn when they learn that it's at certain stage that it's socially inappropriate to express intense emotion they learn to lock emotion by locking the breath and that's one of the things we learn to undo so that's the first thing is the continuous breath to get things cranked up to a good start we usually breathe a little bit faster and a little bit fuller than normal so you're flooding the system with oxygen and you're getting different signals from the body from inside the body and these will in most i found in over 50 percent of cases of all my clients over the years um this will result in bliss fairly rapidly um it's it only in a minority of cases results in, you know, a, thera- a sort of dark stuff coming up and followed by a therapeutic breakthrough. But that, that, that also happens quite often. Yeah, I, um, I found it quite difficult because it is, uh, as you say, it's kind of unnatural as a, as a learned behavior, but also it is the complete mm. opposite of what you do when you scuba dive because you're sort of <laughs> supposed to, like, hold both the in and the out breath. You bounce along a bit, but the, the general idea is to try and conserve the the air in the tank obviously for as long as possible because otherwise you have to come back up mm-hmm. and so i got quite used to um the other end of the spectrum is is much easier for me because you can kind of even out the breath count uh of you know empty lungs breathing in full lungs breathing out and i i have like a scuba um how to describe this i have like a scuba journeying breath at that end of the spectrum so i've i've really enjoyed this the the holotropic thing i did when i was about 20 and i did it because i think i found an afternoon group from a mind body spirit festival in in sydney and it was i I vaguely knew that stanislav grof found these methods because he was looking for a legal replacement for lsd and so was i yeah so uh <laughs> I, I went i went along to two afternoons of that it was intense but this isn't that at all and i'm i i think it's a uh 
I mean, what was it? Okay, let me ask this question because I thought there's uh, having done this, the grand experience of forty minutes over the last two days of uh, connected uh-huh. breath work is. Um, wh- what was it about connected breath work that resonated for you? Um, it was an experience. Uh, I was just plunged into it. I went to um, some public seminars that were run in a medieval castle in the east of Austria on the Hungarian border in 1991. And one of the seminars, this was put together by the IOT, but one of the seminars was um, run by Lionel Snell, a.k.a. Ramsey Dukes. Oh, you've heard of that gentleman, I imagine. Absolutely. Pardon? Yeah, and he uh, he has a well, vast conspectus of skills and experiences. He's been around for a long time and learned all sorts of interesting things. I'd never heard of rebirthing or vibration at the time. And he took about, I learned about 30 of us at the workshop, and he took most of us through a brief session. It was only a 20-minute session. Normally the sessions are more like an hour. Um, and I was having... I was having a few emotional problems at that time. I was having a difficult time with my partner and all sorts of other things. And I went into this state after a a few minutes of this kind of breathing. I went into a state of just unbelievable anger. I couldn't believe how angry I was. I'm sort of lying there on this floor looking up. I am really pissed off. And it's just because I'm breathing. What's going on? And um, at the end, I managed to sort of like, you know, just let it all drain down and was feeling sort of pleasantly lightheaded after it all went away and thinking, God, you can do that with a simple breathing technique. I'm in for some of this. So um, as soon as I got back home, I, I looked around for um, a vivational rebirthing coach and found one in, I was living in Leeds at the time, I found one in Sheffield, which is only 30 miles away. It's where I now live. Um, I came over every couple of weeks for a few months and had a session and it really helped me work through some of my stuff that I, nothing else had managed to had managed to allow me to work through before. There was some quite good emotional healing happened. And I was so impressed by it all. That summer I heard about a course that was going on, professional training in vibration one year. So I, I jumped on that. It's, uh, I, I find, I mean, the book is fantastic because uh, you kind of, we were talking about this before, but uh, if, over the course of your books, you've, kind of snuck an autobiography um, even <laughs> amongst the pages of, of, of several of them. And I, I think I resonate – one, I learned a whole bunch of new stuff in this book, but I, I kind of resonated that with – it almost seems like an updated um, set of – beliefs is the wrong word. It almost seems like an updated set of positions because through the frame of exploring breathwork, you – talk about the different models that we're talking about here. You talk about the toxic dualism and, and the kind of implications for why something like this should work and and how to think about it in session and out of session. And it, it just has this kind of – it's it's a book where people can learn a whole bunch of stuff about breath work, but you also learn the implications of the fact that this shouldn't – as you say, like you're just lying there breathing in and out in a connected way and all of a sudden you're angry or eventually you get to a bliss state and you go, this shouldn't – this is dumb. Why does this work? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, t- uh, one, of the things- one of the switches on the switchboard. Yeah, exactly. And that, I, I love that about the book. Uh, tell people, I mean, I'm fascinated by the snorkel experiment. So, uh, one, because it's warming up here and I think, hmm, I, I, might, I might see if I can't uh, do it. My parents, because they're retired and apparently Swedish, have like this large spa in their backyard. And I'm like, I could probably use that. <laughs> but what's the oh, snorkel experiment? Do, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, I'd advise you to have a few regular breathwork sessions first we'll because I think you'll get more out of it that way. And certainly have someone, have a partner, certainly have someone watching over you because you might go into a very deeply altered state of consciousness. And, of course, you're, you're used to diving. I wasn't, but, you know, I, I'm glad I had someone watching over me. I don't think I'd have just flipped over and drowned or anything, but who knows. So um, it's it, it was quite an amazing experience. Um, yeah, I... Uh, I'd find a coach if I were you and just have one or two sessions, you know, then, then, I mean, okay, at the expense of, pl- of, of plugging my, another of my products, I do do a booklet and CD set, which the CD is 
kind of can act as a virtual coach for somebody who can't find a coach, but I originally designed it for somebody who was in between coach sessions, although a number of people have used it and got decent results who've never had a coach session. Um, but yeah, yeah, best best practice would be to find someone to give you a session or two, an hour long session or two, and then get with get with a get with a friend and do the hot tub thing. And uh, what was that though? Because I, I, I thought this was just like an ama- one of those autobiographical personal experiences. I mean, if you want to tell people what happened to you when you did this, mm. well, it was uh, one of the weekends in the vibration tra- professional training course. It was six weekends over the year where we had different, you know, tried different experiences and different 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 things with breath work. And there were two weekends where we used uh, water, water breathing in water. The, there's a big tradition behind this because um, not so much in the Groff side, the holotropic breathwork side, but in the rebirthing vivation lineage, which comes from Leonard Orr, he um, he got a lot of his old insights by lying around in the bath, apparently. Um, and then water was always a big part of it, and water can deepen the experience. In fact, it took them a while to find out that you didn't need water to do it, Orr's group. Um, so, you know, rebirther lineage people often go back to the water. So. You get in the water, you're floating face downwards with a snorkel on. This takes a while. For, you know, I've never done anything with a snorkel, so it took me a while to get used to. Um, but then it gets quite easy if, you're, if you've if you got the breathwork practice. So that might, maybe if you, since you've already got snorkeling, it might... Um, that that might, you know, at least you've got one of the two skills required, as it were. It might be easier. Um, and just getting into a whole breathwork session, but floating face down. After a point, you get to a stage where your body really doesn't have boundaries anymore. Well, mine didn't. A lot of people report that. It's very much like you're aware from the you know kinesthetic proprioceptive point of view from time to time. There's sort of jerks where it's almost it's almost like clonic twitches. It's almost like you're going to sleep, but you're not going to sleep. You're, you're sort of falling into an oceanic state, occasionally twitching back. And that's all you're aware of, uh, except whatever the content of the oceanic state is. The, the physical side of it is just occasional, you know, these occasional twitches, which you become conscious in a different way. So... The oceanic state is wow, you know, pretty hard to describe. It was just like losing boundaries and um, a little bit like nature mystic sort of type experiences as they're often classified, losing your boundaries to the world, except the world was water. And when I got out of the tub and sort of stood by it, kind of getting used to standing up again, and there was a mirror there. I looked in the mirror and all the tension had drained out of my face. And it, I'm not usually aware that there's that much tension in my face, but my face actually looked longer. I thought, oh, my God, it looks longer because it's no longer scrunched up. So, um, yeah, that was, that's as much as I can describe, really, of what I, what I underwent. Yeah, I'm into it. I think that'd be fun. It, like, the older snorkels, the ones that you would probably get if you're on holiday and you rent them from, like, the beach shack, are probably better for it. They force your mouth open anyway, and you can't breathe through your nose. So, um, the, the fancier new snorkels that are kind of angled and, and, and have the, um, the sort of purge area, I'm sure they'll work just as well. But in my head, I was picturing like a kind of classic 50s to 70s snorkel, which is a sort of like just a rubber J shape that you put in your mouth. And you grip it in, you, you grip it in your mouth, and it, it- goes under your gums yeah. and you have maybe have a peg sort of like a peg thing to close your nose with yeah that's pretty much how we did it you know there's no something to stop the nose breathing i think and just i don't think we bother with a face mask or anything it's just like that yeah i'm into it i'm gonna i will definitely do i actually funny enough after doing the uh the the 20 breath exercises the last couple of days i'm googling around for uh for breathwork people in the wider sydney area so uh i'm, I'm gonna do this this summer no question yeah, great. Well, Mr. Lee, this has been, I feel like we could, and we probably will, uh, we'll definitely have to have you back on, but I feel like we could chat for uh, for a very long time about uh, many things, but uh, I've had you for an hour, so um, you must go. But before we do, for people other than, like, for people who want to know more about yourself and, and your books and your, because uh, you, you offer... Um, you are a connected breathwork trainer as well. So any of this kind of information yeah. for people who want to know more, lay it on them. Sure. Yes. Well, <clears throat> um, 
both my breathwork practice and my books are detailed on my website, kotopia.com, K-O as in chaos without the see, and then topia as in utopia dot com so you can find all the details there there's a there's a few of right there's a few brief writings about breath work there so if you're not sure whether it's for you or not have a look at that and that might help you decide um there's also a book i sell through that the uh, the book and cd set um which are basic instructions in connected breath work and uh, yeah, and a few other a few other fun things. My blog is linked on there as well. And this, for people listening, will of course all be up in the show notes. Okay. Well, Dave, I uh, Dave slash David, Mister Lee, um, I was really looking forward to this. Congratulations! The book is truly fantastic. It's it's a breathwork book mm, that sneaks in you. an autobiography and sneaks in an update of Chaos Magic. So, uh, so very well done, and uh, and uh, we shall definitely have you back on. Done. LSD, Meta Models, The Rise of a 21st Century Spirit Paradigm, Upstream Metaphysics, Chaos Magic, and some heavy breathwork. Be sure to check out the show notes for some links to Dave's published work, blog, newsletter, and other resources. Speaking of other resources, how about a weekly podcast? Be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube or in your favorite podcatcher. Sign up as a RuneSoup Premium member to get hours and hours more content each week. Or, if you're in or comparatively near Australia, come see me at the Devil's Dice Game on August 19th in the Blue Mountains. Details on the blog. Options B through J. Find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.